morning, everyone, and welcome. I thank you for joining us for this learning series webinar today, Doing Your Part, Safe Disposal of Opioids. This webinar is brought to you by the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey and is being held in collaboration with NJ Cares and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General. And I thank them for their partnership, support, and collaboration on today's learning activity and throughout this year-long learning series. We're so pleased that you joined this important conversation today. And this topic is of spe specific significance to our state and to our speakers today, as back in uh, 2009, New Jersey was the first state in the nation to hold a statewide take back and disposal event. And the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey, the DEA, New Jersey, and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General came together to hold what was then called Operation Medicine Cabinet. And we were recognized by the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy um, as a best practice and had received other national recognition on our efforts. And from that came the DEA Take Back Days, the Office of the Attorney General's Project Medicine Drop, and the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey's uh, American Medicine Chest Challenge. And so that was 10 years ago. So much has happened since. And we're so pleased to have our expert speakers with us today who are going to talk to us about how those lessons were put into place, what they've learned, what we're seeing, and what is happening. Um, our speakers today uh, are Susan A. Gibson, Special Agent in Charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration, New Jersey Division, Howard Pine, the Deputy Director of the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General, Division of Consumer Affairs, and Lori Smith, the Community Initiatives Coordinator at Atlantic Prevention Resources. So I thank all of our expert speakers for being with us today. And I will turn the presentation over to Lori Smith to kick us off. Hi, Lori. Thank you, thank you Angela, and good morning, everyone. First, I would like to thank the Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey and the other sponsors for inviting our coalition to present today. Our coalition is joined together Atlantic County, JTAC for short. We cover Atlantic County, New Jersey, which includes shore towns like Atlantic City and rural farming towns like Hamilton, which is known as the blueberry capital of the world. Next slide. Our mission is the prevention of substance use among youth, and our focus is underage drinking, underage marijuana use, and prescription medication misuse. Next slide. We have over 200 members, and as you can see here, we have representation from many sectors within our community. One of our target sectors, or, I'm sorry, our largest sectors is our youth coalition, which we call Stand Up and Rebel, SWAR for short. We have several school chapters, as well as a countywide group that meets monthly. With our adult coalition, we work a lot with law enforcement, healthcare professionals, schools, parents, and other organizations focus on substance use disorders. We also have a faith-based group that meets separately. Next slide. Just to give you a little snapshot of coalitions in New Jersey, there are several types of coalitions that make up the larger prevention network and are always looking to partner with members of the community. First, we have the municipal alliances, which receive funding through the Governor's Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. They are usually small groups of volunteers covering a municipality, although some alliances may be several towns combined to make up a consortium. Next, we have the regional coalitions funded by the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services. There is a coalition in every county and some are regional. Our coalition, JTAC, is part of a regional coalition with Cape May County, and we work together on some projects and then separately on others, since we do have some distinct differences among our populations. There is a statewide network called the New Jersey Prevention Network, and that is their website listed that has contacts for all the regional coalitions, as well as other valuable information. Drug-Free Communities is another coalition grant, and we have many of them throughout the state. JTAC is a current DFC recipient, and our grant covers the entire county, whereas some are just for smaller geographical areas. And the last item listed here, CARA, is a federally funded grant and you must currently have or had a DFC grant to have this funding, but I wanted to list it because it is a grant specifically targeting opioid use. I share this information with you because I'm sure there is a group in your area that you can reach out and partner with. Next slide. The strategic prevention framework is a model that the coalitions utilize to make sure our interventions are addressing the needs of the community. We all have to conduct needs assessments and constantly review data 
to see what issues need to be addressed. The interventions you will hear about today are part of that implementation stage. I wanted to share this. So if you think, um, if you're not part of the prevention field, this way you'll understand that all of these groups I mentioned are not just picking interventions and trying them out. We are constantly using this framework to try and utilize our funding with the most effective projects possible. Next slide. When we pick our interventions in that planning stage, we are using these environmental strategies. It has been proven that effective community change can happen when all of these strategies are being utilized. Most of what we'll be talking about today falls into the enhancing barriers and reducing access category, but some like locking medicine cabinets in homes can be considered changing physical design. And when a police department or a pharmacy installs a drop box, that intervention also includes modifying policies. Next slide. Now, getting into what our coalition has been doing in Atlanta County, we currently have 18 drop boxes overseen by our local police departments, and we've actually placed the majority of those boxes. We actually met with the departments, helped them complete the paperwork and necessary waivers, and then purchased the boxes for them. These boxes are emptied by the police departments, and some have agreements with the sheriff's department to dispose of the medications collected. Our county also has nine pharmacies with disposal boxes, and two of them, we again worked with the pharmacy and purchased the boxes. As you will see in a moment, the pharmacy boxes look a little different. They are med safe boxes, and we purchased them from a company out of Texas. The police departments dispose of their collected medications through their contracted incinerators. However, for the two pharmacies where we installed the boxes, the disposal is handled through the company the boxes are purchased from. In 2020, our police departments collected 2,562 pounds of medication, which is really good considering the issues that were happening regarding COVID during that time. I do not have the final totals for 2021 yet, but we will be over 2,000 pounds once again. And since we started this project back in 2016, our boxes have collected roughly 16,000 pounds of medications. Regarding working with the local police departments, not every department has a box, and sometimes we will have a police chief that will not want a box once they're sworn in. If that happens, don't be discouraged. Most departments and police chiefs have been great and are willing to work with us, and police chiefs do retire. So if you have a department that does not have a box when the new chief is sworn in, set up a meeting with them and do some outreach. I also listed here disposal days and events. We have very few departments who participate in these actual dates now because we have so many boxes that are permanent, but it is still a good time to advertise your boxes and get information out to the community that they are available for medication disposal. One other successful project we began right before COVID, our coalition, along with the Atlantic County Prosecutor's Office, held a take back event at several housing authority properties. The residents are people who may have a lot of expired and unused medication, but have no transportation to get to a disposal box. We collected medication that they brought down to the community area, and we distributed information to the residents on those days, as well as gave them drug deactivation bags that we'll talk about in a moment. The offices of those residential buildings even took cases of the disposal bags to be able to give out to residents when needed. Next slide. As you can see here, um, this is just some of the top left is one of those um, take back events we did at a housing authority location. Um, in the center here, it is one of our pharmacies, it's Bunting Family Pharmacy. And that's why that box looks a little bit different than the two on the right, which are the ones we have in our local police departments. Next slide. If you're wondering how you can get your youth involved, here is a great intervention that they really enjoy doing. Um, at one of our local town festivals, high school students dressed up like zombies and walked around with signs that said, which is scarier, zombies or medicine in your medicine cabinet. And they also um, manned a table with information and disposal bags. And it was just a great opportunity to get them involved, to learn about the dangers of medication misuse and to also help educate the public. Next slide. As I mentioned, these are drug disposal bags. We purchased them and have been given donations of them. 
If you do not know what they are, it is a safe way of disposing of medication in your homes, including liquids. You simply open the pouch, put in the medication and some water, and then wait a minute and then seal the pouch and throw it away. Inside, there's a carbon filter that is activated by the water and destroys the medication. We have distributed over 50,000 of these in our county. For the police departments, we offer a bin to be adhered to the side of their drop boxes, and these can be put in there for residents to take home. We have delivered them to healthcare agencies and physician offices. Each year in the summer, we visit each of our pharmacies, which there's about 55 in our county, and we give them information for their patients, as well as offer them the deterra bags. And also we do outreach to veterinarians. If you do not know, vets do prescribe medication, including opioids to their patients. And these scripts are not recorded in the prescription drug monitoring program. So we've had a lot of really good feedback from the veterinarians for working with them because they said they are not contacted a lot with this issue and they really appreciate us reaching out and dropping off information. Next slide. Thank you. Um, we also reach out to our hospice, uh, if you can go back one. There you go, thank you. We also outreach to all of our hospice organizations. We used to visit them in person, and now each year we send a letter to them because they're always contacting us when they need materials. They um, give the disposal bags to families after a loved one has passed and provide information on how to dispose of the medications which sometimes when you're um, dealing with a family who has just lost a loved one who was in hospice, it actually can be a lot of medication. So it's good that we give out these cards with the information on where all of our permanent boxes are. Um, we also reach out to funeral homes to provide the same information. We're currently partnering with Stockton University to have the disposal bags on campus at their wellness center and health services building. For realtors, we provide tips for their clients to make sure they remove medications during an open house, just as they would other valuables. And prior to COVID, we have partnered with senior centers, senior centers, giving a short presentation during their luncheons and other events regarding medication safety and distributed disposal bags. And we actually um, give an example and show them how to use the bags. And then we do distribute information to schools and at other community events. Next slide. So we also do a lot with medication safety besides just disposal. We have provided thousands of these locking medicine cabinets to community members. A great partnership has been with agencies like family support organizations, the Division of Child Protection and Permanency and Youth Behavioral Agencies. They actually take 10 to 25 boxes at once and distribute them to their families that they work with. We also mail signs to the physicians to post in their offices and we get a lot of calls from their patients who are community members who ask to stop by and pick up the cabinet. The prescription bottle you see on the right, um, we actually have them as stickers and um, that one pictured is a magnet. We distribute the magnets with all of our outreach and the stickers are given to pharmacies to use them to seal the bags of medications for their patients. The last thing listed here, we have not had any success with, but we do reach out to our local municipalities to educate them that requiring a locking medicine cabinet in new construction or bathroom renovations is a good way to help deter youth access. This idea was actually brought to us by two separate police officers that were members of our coalition. Next slide. I know this slide's kind of hard to see, but I just wanted to just give you an example that we have on um, on our website, we have a page specifically for prescription drug disposal. The page has information about medication disposal and safety, as well as a video on how to use the disposal bags and even where to dispose of syringes since they cannot be disposed of in our boxes. We include this list of all police and government locations of drop boxes. And if you notice here, the one location is Buena Vista Township Town Hall. That's one of our towns that does not have a police department. They are actually overseen by another department. And um, in the Buena Borough City Hall, the Franklin Township Police Department empties their box. And that one we actually did have to get a special waiver for since it's not located in a police department, but in the city hall itself. Next slide. And here is a list of the pharmacy locations that we have on our website. 
even if it's not one that we purchased and placed. As you can see here, we do try to include information for the individual boxes, including if that location will take liquids or not. We um, try to offer the hours of operation so they know when to access the boxes. And when they click on the get directions link, they can actually then put in their address and it'll give them the information on how to get to that location. Next slide. And this is my contact information. Feel free to contact me if you would like any information on anything I presented, and I will be available for questions after the presentations are done. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, that's great information on, on what you're doing at the local level. And I know um, our next speaker, Howard Pine from Division of Consumer Affairs um, has a lot of, um, experience as well at the local level with Project Medicine Drops. So um, Howard, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Great, thank you, Angela. And, and I wanna thank the Partnership for Drug Free New Jersey as well for allowing us to participate in today's event. Um, Howard Pine, Deputy Director at the Division of Consumer Affairs. I generally work to oversee the operations of the 51 professional occupational boards, uh, but I also assist in the administration of the state's Project Medicine Drop program um, and as Angela mentioned earlier, the initiative was developed in 2009 and slowly we, we, we built our, ourselves on, on, on really on, on the shoulders of the DA take back days and, and the initiatives before us. But um, it has become a part of the division's efforts now to halt the abuse and diversion of prescription drugs. And we really believe it's a, become an important tool in the fight against uh, opioid abuse. Um, oh, sorry, next slide. And you can move on to the next slide as well. I apologize. Um, so Project Medicine Drop uh, in its simplest form really is an initiative which places one of these mailbox sized boxes which you see on your screen now in partner police departments across the state uh, that allow for the general public to dispose of unused and unexpired medications anonymously, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and in many locations, 24 hours a day. Um, Next slide. Uh, and today I really just want to provide you with a, a, a brief uh, history of, of the program itself and, and to maybe give some uh, awareness to a program that some of you may not be familiar with. Um, as you can see from the slide, we, we launched in 2011. So we're, we're looking at now 10, 11 years of the program. We launched a pilot program with three departments, one in the North, one in Central Jersey, and one in, in, in the South. And within a year, we had, uh, and through the promotion of the program with our partners uh, and through the Attorney General's office, we had expanded to uh, 27 boxes within the first year. Um, next slide, please. Uh, within three years, we were up to 100 boxes across the, straight, across the state, and then soon thereafter, we launched uh, another component of the program, which is our, our mobile drop box uh, component. And this allowed police departments really to, to bring a smaller mobile, as the name indicates, box to events throughout the jurisdictions of that police department in order to make it easier for individuals to drop off medications at that time. And it's, it's very similar in listening to Lori's uh, speech. Uh, there are a lot of uh, synergies between our, our, our two programs. Um, but this, this, mobile, this mobile box unit has really been uh, instrumental in, in, in places where, for example, senior, uh, senior living communities where individuals may not have the ability or may not have a vehicle or may not uh, be able to get their prescription medications to a police department. So uh, we've added on that component to uh, the, the program at large. Um, the next slide, please. Um, as you can see, in 2015, we actually expanded to uh, really in, uh, to the New Jersey-based military uh, locations. We installed uh, the two boxes at these two locations. I believe they're the only two in the, in the state currently with, with our military. Um, and then, as you can see, it's interesting because Lori mentions this, mentioned this as well with realtors. Um, as a side note, we had become aware of, for lack of a better term, an insidious way prescription medications were being illegally obtained. Um, as a result, we partnered with Doby, the Department of Banking and Insurance's Real Estate Commission. And we sent out notices to, I believe, all 70, I think there are 70,000 real estate brokers in the state. 
uh, reminding them or informing them to remind their clients that they should be putting away all prescription medications during an open house, during the showing of an apartment or, or, or a house on the market. Uh, because we had become aware of uh, numerous in incidents where individuals were going to open houses and stealing medications right out of people's homes and apartments. Uh, the next slide. In 2016, actually on January 1st, 2016, a law was passed which required pharmacies and prescribers to post notices about Project Medicine Drop and some other take back programs around, around the state. And you, if, if you've been to a pharmacy of late and I have uh, over the last two days, a few pharmacies, um, you, they still have those notices up there. And we have photos and they'll, they'll be instantly probably, hopefully recognizable once you, um, once you see the photos later on in the presentation. But uh, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, as you can see, 2016, we installed our 200th box and currently we're at 287 boxes across the state, uh, which, uh, and I believe there are approximately 550 municipalities in New Jersey. So given that it's 287 of our boxes, um, Laura even mentioned there's 18 Atlantic County, there's other private uh, organizations that are that are contributing to this effort, it's really safe to assume now that there's no individual in New Jersey that's more than a 20 or 30 minute a drive away from one of either our Project Medicine Drop locations or, or some of the other. So it's really become accessible throughout the state to see one of these large medicine drop boxes, either in a police department or in a pharmacy itself. Um, next, next slide, please. And the next few slides are really just to provide you more of a visual representation of the growth of the program and where the, and, and where the program is essentially situated throughout the state. Um, and, and you can look, we're in tw all 21 counties now, but as you can see in 2012, we had the 27 locations. Uh, next slide. And, and as, we, as we move along, um, I'm sorry, I have a, as we move along, uh, you can see it in increasing further. Um, and I believe this is the, I believe this is the last number from, uh, this might have all 200, oh, no, next slide. This I think is 158 boxes. Yeah, there we go, 158 boxes, uh, which is almost, which is more than half of what we have now in 2015. And you can move to the next slide. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, here we're, is where we stand right now. You can see the Bergen County has uh, the, the most boxes given the, the population and number of municipalities. Morris and Atlanta County, they have their own program. So you'll see a smaller number in, in those counties, but still uh, it, it's a tremendous number of, of boxes that you can see throughout the state right now. Um, if you can move to the, to the next slide. And here is another sort of visual, visual representation of the, the increase in, in boxes across the state, uh, a tremendous amount of, of, of promotion and, and interest from our police partner police departments, really the first five or six years. We've added on slowly but surely during the, 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 the last several years, but at some point there, there is a saturation point given that, as I mentioned, I think there's 550 municipalities, which means there's probably about 550 uh, local police departments. So, uh, even though we're, we're growing slowly, we still get uh, inquiries and we're still building our, our, our building with our partners uh, on, on a monthly basis now. Uh, if you can move to the next slide as well. Um, and here uh, is what we've seen in terms of, I'll call it poundage, uh, the number of pounds we've collected uh, over the, the, the life of the program itself. Uh, obviously, 2011, we only had three three uh, police departments participating, and it's expanded to close to close to 100,000 pounds per year. With Lori as well, sometimes we don't get the, I'd say these prop, these numbers are maybe about 5% off. Uh, sometimes the numbers don't come in um, exactly, when, uh, exactly on a quarterly basis. So that's really an approximate number, but it's close to the it's close to the actual number. You can see there's a dip in 2019, 2000, uh, 2020, 2021. Uh, given the pandemic, uh, some of the police departments close up their boxes during that time, but we expect the numbers to increase up to that 100,000 pound range over the next, uh, during uh, 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in total, I think we've, we've, we've amassed close to a half a million pounds of uh, prescription uh, medications have been collected and they are um, 
similar to the Atlanta County program that Lori mentioned, we, the police departments that partner with our program, uh, we have partnered with a, a company that incinerates the, pro, incinerates the drugs for free. So the police department just has to schedule a, a day to drop off the, the medications with uh, the company and, and that company, Covanta, will incinerate the, incinerates the, the medications for us. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, I did want to show a picture of our small mobile uh, box. These are about, about two and a half to three feet high, uh, foot and a half wide. And as I mentioned earlier, the, they're used in, 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 in many community events. Uh, one of the events that's not mentioned here is uh, in addition to National Night Out, uh, Drop, Stop and Roll programs, senior living locations are uh, back to school nights is something that we, we, we tried to promote as well. Uh, given that the, the, the week before school starts might be a good opportunity for, for uh, families to bring prescription drugs to, uh, to an event where many, many people uh, participate in the, the back to school nights. So this is what the, the small, pro, small boxes look like. Uh, if you have a local police department, I, I'll make the pitch as well, and they do not have this box, please let them know that we have uh, a lot of boxes available. Um, so we have, we, we did create an event last year where we were handing out boxes to any police department available, uh, any de police department that would like a box. We handed out quite a few, but we still have a few left. So um, I'll make that pitch out there to everybody as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and these are the, the, these are, again, are the, um, the small mobile boxes. These are some of the, the flyers that we've handed out to people all across the state. I think the next slide is uh, also a similar slide. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, another visual representation. This is a little bit old. Uh, actually, once we hit the 287 market, it, it, it kind of um, enveloped the state. But I wanted to give you an idea of, of what we have out there in the state. As I mentioned, currently, there, there, is, there is really not a place in New Jersey where you have to travel very far to see one of our boxes or one of the other boxes with uh, some of the private organizations out there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, this is the law that that was, this is the bill that was signed into law in, on January 1st, 2016, requiring prescribers and pharmacies to provide the notice. And if you go on to the next slide, and these are, these are the, the um, notices that are up in pharmacies all across the state. Again, now many pharmacies have their own small uh, box as well, but you, you, can, you can find these notices both in English and I believe in Spanish on the next slide as well uh, across the state. Yes. Um, and, and finally, uh, you can move to the next slide as well. Finally, I just wanted to give a few more, I know limited for time, but I wanted to say a, a few tiny more uh, add-ons. First, I just wanted to emphasize the, the fact that the program is for the general public and not for use by businesses. We have had on occasion uh, veterinarian offices or physician offices using the project medicine drop boxes for their own disposal. Uh, this is not permitted. Um, it's really, we want, to, we want to, again, capture the general public's prescription medications. Um, and we think it's important actually just to understand what kind of numbers we're talking about that it's really coming from the general public and not from, from businesses per se. Uh, also, the boxes themselves can only accept solid medications, not liquids, such as the medical waste or syringes. Also, uh, can't accept uh, devices such as vaping devices, because as we learned, uh, apparently that with the batteries inside the vaping devices, these devices can actually explode when heated. Um, and uh, we've been warned not to uh, allow these devices to be uh, put in the boxes themselves. Uh, we have additional tips on our website about the disposal of medications and devices that can't be deposited in our PMD box. Easiest way to find us, really, I would say, is just Google New Jersey Pro Project Medicine Drop New Jersey. You'll get to the website a lot quicker than me citing a, a, a URL. Um, look, at the, look at the information there. You can find out where your closest, day, closest location is to you. And uh, look forward to any questions you have at the end of the program. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Howard, um, you know, as I know you and I have discussed in the past, New Jersey is so fortunate to have so many opportunities for safe disposal, you know, within easy access of so many communities. 
Um, so thank you for, you know, for that and, and for all that uh, Project Medicine Drop does. I know together, um, the Partnership for Drug for New Jersey and Project Medicine Drop distributed over uh, a close to 100,000 pharmacy bags uh, at the beginning of this year with messaging on how to uh, locate a place to uh, safely dispose of unused, unwanted, and expired medicine. So thank you for your uh, partnership as well as your, you know, your leadership on, on this issue. Um, now I'm going to turn the presentation over to uh, Susan Gibson. She is special agent in charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration, New Jersey Division. DEA New Jersey has always been a great partner um, to the Partnership for Drug New Jersey, but as well as other organizations in the state, particularly um, on this issue. And um, oh, special agent, um, in charge Gibson, we're, we're so happy to have you with us today. Um, so welcome, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. Angela, thank you for having me uh, today on a very important topic. Uh, my name is Susan Gibson. I'm a special agent in charge with the DEA New Jersey Division. Uh, next slide, please. The mission of, of, of the Diversion Control Division is to prevent and detect and investigate the diversion of pharmaceutical controlled substances and listed chemicals. Uh, our goal is to identify any diversion of pharmaceuticals outside of the closed system of distribution. Next slide, please. Again, diversion is a deviation of a controlled substance or chemical that goes outside of the closed system of distribution that is identified as diversion. Next slide, please. Again, the closed system of distribution, what DEA does, they track uh, from a raw uh, product to all the way to the manufacturing of the pill to the ultimate user. So we call it the closed distribution system of distribution where we track that product uh, to make sure it is done correctly and it goes by DEA standards into the person that needs it. And at the end of the time, the ultimate user that's prescribed to them. Next slide, please. DEA is over the registration process for all uh, people who actually handle any kind of certain uh, uh, schedule one through five controlled substances and listed chemicals. Currently, we have 1.9 million registrants in, in the United States. I believe I have 56,000 registrants here in New Jersey alone. Next slide, please. There's different types of registrants that are out there. The type A is your general, uh, could be the, the first line that actually prescribes and distributes uh, the, the pharmaceutical. Uh, type B is more of the manufacturers, distributors, importers, exporters, uh, reverse distributors. Uh, we provide standards for canine handlers to train their dogs and also narcotic treatment programs and to include chemical registrants. Next slide, please. Uh, obviously, the opioid crisis, it, it's, it, it's traumatic in this country. Um, we work closely with the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services, SAMHSA, which reports the majority of people who misuse a prescription medication obtain the medicine from a family member or friend. Next slide, please. Uh, within the past year, we've lost 100,000 Americans to drug overdoses within last year. 64% of them have been from uh, synthetic opioids, which is primarily fentanyl. 28% involved the psychostimulant, primarily methamphetamine. This is a very scary number. Next slide, please. Uh, to put it in more perspective, 275 people a day die if a 70, 757 airliner crashed. That's how many people we lose to this, this epidemic daily. Out of those 275 people, 175 of them die from the fentanyl opioid overdose. So we use these analogies to really put this in perspective to understand how many people we're losing every day. Next slide, please. It's definitely a public safety, public health, and national security threat. We're losing our loved ones. I don't think there's anybody in this world right now that hasn't been affected in some way, shape, or form from a drug overdose, uh, you know, from a loved one or somebody that's still going through the throes of addiction. Next slide, please. Criminal networks first exploited the opioid crisis by flooding the U.S. with very pure and cheap heroin. 
Uh, these same networks are now flooding the U.S. with deadly counterfeit prescription pills to prey on Americans for their profit. Many of these pills contain deadly fentanyl and methamphetamine. The pills are designed to appear nearly identical to legitimate prescriptions such as oxycodone, Percocet, Vicodin, Adderall, and others. And they're making it so much easier for the youth to get a hold of these counterfeit pills through social media, e-commerce, and the dark web. DEA uh, has a campaign right now, One Pill Can Kill, which we're trying to get as much information out there to everybody so we can stop even one person from taking one pill, because that one pill can kill you. Next slide, please. Again, you know, what we have experienced in the past, a lot of times drug trafficking organizations, they really cater to grabbing the attention of, of the younger uh, generation. Right now, social media is the biggest problem right now. They're using emojis in certain sequential order to order products online. Um, it's, it's very scary being a parent out there. And I suggest everybody get familiar with the social media, what their children are, are engaging with, and understand that this is happening uh, on websites and social media sites that uh, your children are on right now. For more information on this, you got to go to DEA.gov um, because it's, it's you know, the, the emoji threads are different for each type of drug. So it's very important to learn this. Next slide, please. Again, online, we need to have everyone aware that this is what's happening. Uh, you know, we're trying to get this information out to the youth in, in this country so they can stop taking or they even think twice for taking that one pill. Um, again, you're never supposed to take any kind of pill that's not directly prescribed to you. Uh, we need to share this information to anybody who's going to listen regarding the deadly uh, uh, cause or the dead, deadliness of fentanyl out there. Next slide, please. DEA understands that a lot of the problems start with uh, experimentation just from their own medicine cabinets at home. So in 2009, the DEA division, uh, New Jersey division actually partnered with the Drug Free New Jersey and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General, resulting in the collection of more than 9,000 pounds of medicine. Uh, DEA headquarters then created the national program uh, in October 2010. So we started this here for DEA here in this great state. Next uh, slide, please. The Take Back Day was initiated nationally. Um, it's a way to get Americans to rid their homes of unneeded medication. Uh, in, we encourage the public to remove these medications as a way of preventing medication misuse and opioid addiction from ever starting. Again, let's take that ability to experiment away from, from people by getting any kind of medicine through a medicine cabinet at home. Next slide, please. The results are, are, are just amazing. Uh, since the program inception in 2009, New Jersey alone has taken off 325,000 pounds of old, unwanted, or no longer needed medications. Nationally, since 2010, we have taken 15.2 million pounds of medications you know, off the street. Uh, we have more than 4,000 drop-off locations nationwide. That is amazing, the amount of product that we get off the street through this, this uh, this program. Next slide, please. Our next DEA Take Back Day is Saturday, April 30th, 2022. Again, you can go to deatakeback.com uh, to find out any of this collection sites near you and year round too, if you need to get uh, rid of any kind of expired medication or any unwanted or unneeded medication. Next slide, please. And again, I, I can't say it enough, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, they have an amazing website set up that you can put in your zip code and it can directly lead you to help that you need for yourself or for a loved one. It's, it's a great resource and, and I can't say enough about it. All right, everyone, thank you very much. And I look forward to any kind of questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Zach. And that was um, really great um, information. And, and thanks for sharing about the upcoming um, take back events, because I know that uh, there's always a lot of interest and that really continues the conversation as you have those biannual events. So thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, I know we have a lot of questions coming into the chat about whether there'll be an opportunity to um, see a copy of the um, presentation or the slides 
And uh, that information will be emailed to you after, after the event. But we have some questions. And I think, uh, Lori, I'm going to start um, with you on this one. We have um, some questions in about what what are some strategies that work with engaging the elderly in, in the community? And I know, Howard, you touched on this as well, so we'll go to you after. But um, the question is, you know, I work with elderly. Are there services for available? Is there a way to speak to the seniors in my community about how important it is to secure and dispose of their medicines? So, Lori, I'll go to you first with that question. Absolutely. Thank you, Angela. And thank you for that question. Um, I think it's important to know that it, we're not going to reach everybody. But one thing we have found beneficial is going to where seniors are meeting, whether it's bingo night or luncheons. A lot of our towns do have senior citizen centers. So actually I'm um, partnering with them. And I will tell you when you're um, right about to, you know, be in the way of senior citizens and them getting to enjoy their lunch, we don't take too long, too much time. We may only have, you know, 15, 20 minutes to talk about it, but we do remain there and give the information and show them how to use the packages. And I do know a lot of um, like even at the over 55 plus communities, they have community centers and may have meetings and things like that. So I think um, just kind of doing that outreach, maybe contacting your county health department, because a lot of times they actually oversee the community centers or could give you the contact for them and going to where the seniors are located best and just doing a short presentation, like I said, kind of keep it simple. They do want to move on to their activity and um, present them with the information and make sure you're providing the deter bags or whatever type of disposal you have, even if it's partnering with your prosecutor's office that day. All right, thank you. And Howard, I know you spoke a little bit about mobile collection with seniors. Anything you wish to add on that? Uh, no, I, I, actually, Lori covered it very well. And, and I'll be honest, we haven't done as much outreach. We, we, we kind of rely on, on the partners um, across the state to, to sort of make the pitch to uh, local community centers and, and, and senior centers to to promote uh, projects where they think uh, it would be best utilized. We, our directors in, in the past have, have gone out to talk to seniors um, about other, uh, other types of, um, for example, scams, because we are the Division of Consumer Affairs, scams that are uh, generally uh, geared towards seniors as well. And I think this is something that we could add on to that, uh, the, add on to those uh, conversations. And I think uh, it's, it's actually a good idea for us to uh, to move in that direction. But generally it's the, the police departments um, that that are devising ways in which to use the, the, the boxes themselves, the mobile boxes. But these are actually great ideas that I'm going to take away from to increase our presence uh, on, a, on a statewide basis. No, absolutely. And, you know, obviously with the pandemic, it's been difficult to get out and speak to um, organizations or groups of seniors even. So um, absolutely looking forward to, to you know, what uh, best practices exist and how they can be used to continue to share that, um, those messages. Um, Seth Gibson, uh, here's a question for you. Um, when there is a um, disposal event, is someone um, allowed to dispose of someone else's medicines that they may have in their home or is it specifically the responsibility of the person who the, it is prescribed to uh, to dispose of them? The question comes specifically, can a home health nurse dispose of a CDS on a patient's behalf? I'm not, I'm not sure if you're with us. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, you know, obviously it's a very sensitive subject because I mean, really the only person that's supposed to All right. I think we lost you for a minute. Sack, are you with us? All right. I think we lost the sack for a second. So, um, Lori, I'm going to go back to you with another question until um, until she's back. Um, any recommendations Internet you can connection give? Connection oh. is unstable. I'm sorry, Sack. We lost you for a good um, minute or two in the middle there. Not sure if you want to restart. 
Do you have me now? We have you now. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. <laughs> um, going back to uh, the question about, you know, obviously when you have somebody in your family that passes away, I mean, really technically that prescription is supposed to be in the possession of the person that it is prescribed to. However, uh, we understand that there is a time and a place where medic medication needs to be disposed of properly. Uh, it is an anonymous uh, situation. We're just asking you to, to get it out of the reach of, of any kids out there and make sure it's disposed of properly. This is the opportunity to get those drugs and get them to a secure location where they can uh, dis be disposed of in the proper way. That's okay, great. And that that's obviously with take back um, events that happen um, twice a year, there are those opportunities for anyone um, to dispose as, you, as you're saying, um, you know, to really help with that diversion prevention. Um, is there any, uh, just as a follow-up question on that, um, can you speak to why someone can't return their medicines? I know you talked about kind of the closed circle in your presentation, but um, the questions are coming in. Why can't I just bring my medications back to a hospital or a pharmacy? Can you speak to that as well? There are uh, locations on the website that are up, up and running 365 days a year. The, the reason why we want you to take them to those specific locations is because they have a proper disposal system because we cannot put these medications, we cannot flush them down the toilet, we cannot get them into our water system. So to have a proper disposal to make sure that it, it, it's good for the environment, we have to take it to those locations that are approved to dispose of them. And not all uh, registrants out there have that ability. And doctors cannot reuse medication. Medication cannot be reused anyway. So also, too, there's a lot of long-term care facilities out there. We know we go out to them um, about twice a year to obtain those drugs. But long-term care facilities should have a mechanism set up where uh, they can house those unneeded and unwanted medications until they're properly disposed of. All right, thanks so much. Um, Howard, a question for you. If someone is utilizing Project Medicine Drop uh, box, is there anything they need to do to the medicine bottle? Um, do they need to remove the label? Can they, do they have to keep it in the label? Um, is it a case by case basis on the department? Is it, can you add? We would recommend removing the label. Um, you don't have to. There, nobody's going through the medication. It's being incinerated at the at the location. But we'd still recommend uh, just the removal of the label when when you drop off the drugs. All right. Uh, thank you. And and Lori, I know I was going to go to you earlier with this question. Um, just some. I, I know you spoke about some recommendations on uh, safe storage in the home. Um, you talked about lock boxes. Can you? Give some more tips or, or share um, a strategy that you know of that has worked. Sure, um, definitely. I think, and I know there was um, some comments just about having medications in the bathroom and stuff. And, and I really think, I, I don't think anybody should have their medications in a bathroom, especially one that can be accessed by anybody else in the household, whether it's youth, even their friends coming over to hang out, or, you know, if anybody comes over to your house, if you have a barbecue or something like that. So I actually have one of the locking medicine cabinets and I keep it in my closet just because you don't want anybody to have any access. And we know these boxes can easily be taken themselves. So I think it's important, you know, just to have them. And a lot of times, you know, some people may have the medications in their kitchen cabinet. And then, you know, a maintenance person or something may come in their home. So I think it's definitely important, especially when we're talking opioids and, you know, narcotics, not to have the medications accessible to children and other people in the home. It is a diversion issue. And um, when it comes to just disposal, I mean, a lot of times people will have some type of injury and have pain medication and think like, well, I'm going to hang on to this just in case, you know, just in case in a couple of days I need it again. And then they forget about it and that medication's left there for months, if not years. So I think just an ongoing, you know, those DEA take back days and things are great times just to remind everyone, remove old medications, whether you can get it to a drop box or using one of the disposal packages. There are other types of disposal um, systems out there that your coalition or municipal alliance or, you know, group could look into to utilize. 
Thanks, Lori. And um, Howard, there are some questions. You mentioned that there are uh, a limited number of boxes that are available for um, police departments. How can our, our attendees help facilitate those conversations between um, their local law enforcement and your um, your office if if they need a disposal box in their community? So I would I would recommend just asking the the local police department if they have if they'd like to do an event. Do you have a a mobile box? I mean, I think that's we we have about 150 boxes on standby, uh, so to speak, that we can we can provide pretty much at a almost a, a, a moment's notice to police departments if they if they're willing to uh, to utilize them. So we have a lot of these mobile boxes at the ready. Um, so I would just ask that they contact the local police department, say we'd like to have an event um, at XYZ. Do you have a mobile box with Project Medicine Drop? And, and then hopefully the, the department will reach out to us and then we can get them that box as soon as possible. Yeah, that's, um, that's very helpful. And Howard, can you also add, um, there's a lot of questions about um, do uh, the local police departments who have a Project Medicine Drop Box accept liquids. Um, can you speak to some of the local rules or the overall rules on that? Sure, sure. Um, the boxes are not supposed. Again, it's a it's a bit difficult. We, we we hope that because it's a anonymous and b people are placing their the medications sometimes in a to the box itself. Um, the expectation is that. Uh, and there are notices up on the um, labels on the boxes, which should say that no liquids are no liquids are permitted in in the box itself. Uh, as I mentioned, vaping devices and, and devices that may have batteries are not are, are not permitted in the box itself. Uh, we're really looking for those uh, pills, patches, things of that nature uh, to to be entered into the box. Those those are the standard rules that should apply to um, all police departments across the state. Oh, thanks, Howard. And I uh, just want to make mention that the evaluation um, has been launched. So if, if everyone could take a minute uh, to fill out the evaluation and give us your thoughts on today's today's learning event. Um, but Howard, back to your point about the, the mobile sites. I mean, with, with the DEA Take Back Day coming up and the opportunity to have a mobile location, I mean, I think I find they're so um, important and significant and especially as we come out of two years of not having these in-person events to um, really share information about why it's important that we safely dispose of art and used and wanted an expired medicine. And also to bring awareness to the fact that these um, uh, disposal locations exist and may exist in your community 24-7. Um, so I think, um, I think it's really a great opportunity um, to get the message out as well as have a place to safely dispose. So thank you for Absolutely. that. I couldn't agree more. And and we intend to do another, uh, we had an event, uh, Angela, you probably remember, I forget exactly when the event was, was it last, um, last fall, uh, where we had um, the mobile boxes in three locations for police departments to pick up either in Cherry Hill, in Titton Falls, or uh, sure. up in yes. Avenel, and it, for police departments to sign up and pick up boxes, we we intend to have another event like that to provide the opportunity for police departments to come and, and pick up these boxes. They can always come to other locations, but if if we have sure, if a, you make North... it closer and more convenient, right? You can <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh, everyone we to have, have one that, of those again um, in their hand. So I just want to go um, to each of you, and and so we have a, a varied um, audience with us today. And uh, there's a lot of questions on, again on how they can um, support this or what they can do with that, within their community to share, um, you know, the message about the importance of safe disposal. So, um, Lori, I'll start with you. What what would you tell our attendees is, is the you know the top thing uh, that they can do to to support uh, the message of, of uh, safe disposal. Sure, I would um, definitely reach out as in the beginning of my presentation when I talked about all the different municipal alliances 
and the different coalitions. There's definitely one in every county in the state of New Jersey. Um, if you're not from New Jersey, I would contact your local health department because they most likely have a unit that addresses substance use and um, ask them what they're doing and how you can partner with them. If you're having an event, even if it's at your local faith-based organization or at a school, um, invite them out to bring out information and um, just be aware of the issue. And there's a lot of groups across the state too, like even the sustainable New Jersey green teams who are even working with their departments, their police departments that have the permanent drop boxes. And as the um, special agent in charge Gibson said, we do not want this heading into our sewage treatment plants because medications are not treated. So making sure people are not flushing medications still down the toilet and making sure that they're finding a proper disposal, you know, way of way of disposing the medication. So I think definitely just reaching out to your local coalition or your local municipal alliance and even your public health department and find out what they're doing and how you can help and volunteer and spread the information. Definitely when um, Partnership for New Jersey does its knockout opioid abuse day on October 6th, there's a great way to volunteer and get this information and information about opioids and proper disposal out to the community. You know, thanks. Um, it's True, um, October 6th is Knockout Opioid Abuse Day, and it is an opportunity. And we have a five step uh, message that we share. It's called the American Medicine Chest Five Step Challenge. It's take inventory of what you have in your home, secure what you need to keep, uh, safely dispose of your unused, unwanted, and expired medicine. Um, make sure that you um, only take the medicine um, that you need to take as prescribed and that it's your prescription and talk to the children and your loved ones about, about this issue, because the more we communicate about it, the more knowledge there is. But um, uh, thank you, Lori, and thank you for being with us today. Um, Howard, um, one last message you'd like to share with all of our attendees just on, on what they can do uh, to support the, the message of, of Project Medicine Drop? Well, I would really just steal Lori's answer. Uh, it was a great answer. I think it covered a lot. I think if individuals have, uh, if if they have questions um, or, or if they, they have an event in mind and they speak with their local police department and, and police department's not aware or does not have a box, uh, you can contact me directly. I can reach out to the police department um, and coordinate with them to get uh, pamphlets out to get a mobile box unit out to them as soon as possible. Um, I should have done what Lori did, which was to have my email address at the end of my presentation instead of the beginning of the presentation, but I can, uh, my email address, I'll just say it out loud, is pine like the tree, P-I-N-E, and then H at uh, DCA, uh, Division Consumer Affairs, dot N-J-O-A-G dot gov. So pine H at DCA dot njoag.gov uh, and please contact me and I can reach out. We have partners, as I mentioned, uh, throughout the state. So um, I think that that's the message I would uh, I would provide to everybody. Uh, we're always looking to, if you have further ideas um, about expanding Project Medicine Drop in your area, please let me know um, because we, we are, we're excited to partner uh, every day. We, we, on a monthly basis, we're getting reach out from uh, other departments. So we continue to grow, even though it's maybe at a slower pace than it was in the, in, at the inception of the program. Oh, thanks so much, Howard. And um, we will share a link to um, DCA, uh, the Division of Consumer Affairs, and Project Medicine Drop in the uh, post-event email that all of our attendees will receive. So that'll help connect to Great. you as well. And um, so, and thank you, Howard, for being with us today. Um, and uh, Sack Gibson, I'll leave you with the final, final message um, to all of our attendees. What can they do to help prevent diversion within their communities and, and support um, the DEA Take Back Days? Well, I, you know, Howard and Lori are, are amazing sources of information, and and you know, I can't, I can't reiterate enough like how important they are and what they do and getting this stuff off the street. I can't tell you how important it is to get uh, 
you know, your unused, unneeded medications, get them out of the hands of anybody that comes into your house, get them out of the hands of any young person that wants to experiment and get rid of them, give them to us so we can dispose of them. But right now, DEA's, our main concern right now is messaging too. We got to get information out about, you know, how deadly this stuff is. And we have to educate people and we have to get to um, kids. We have to get to kids as young as we can to make sure that they understand what they're putting in their body and they know what they're putting in their body. Um, so messaging right, right now for us is just so important because this stuff is killing people. And you don't even have to be in the throes of addiction to take the one wrong pill. And, and that's what we're trying to get across to everybody. So we'll take anything you got uh, other than liquid and we'll take vapes, vape pens minus the batteries, and we'll take anything. Um, just get it out of the hands of, of someone who wants to experiment or someone who's, who's going through the throes of addiction. So I, I can't thank you all enough. Reach out for us, dea.gov or deatakeback.gov. We will get you the information that you need and, and we can't thank you enough for doing what you do. Thanks so much. And we'll be sure to share um, with all of our attendees post-event uh, link to the um, Take Back Day information as well, uh, because I know that's that's coming up next month. Um, I want to, um, once again, thank all of our expert panelists for being with us today. And I want to thank all of our attendees for being with us today and for all that you do um, to prevent opiate misuse at, here in New Jersey. Um, our upcoming event is on Thursday, October 28th. It's combating the stigma of opioid addiction. And I hope that um, you can join us for that event as well. We have an esteemed panel uh, joining us to, to discuss that topic. So I wanna thank all of you again for being with us and uh, I wish you well, have a uh, good day.